Thank you very much, Sir Siu Fong, Sir Cheng, and Sir May for today's Sunday Puja chanting. Now back with us this week, we have Brother Ananda Hong to share on caring for the family and peaceful livelihood. Lessons from Mangala Sutta and Sutta Nipata 2.4. Brother Ananda, over to you. Uh, please allow me to share screen. To start off, we'll do a short puja. Namo tasa bhagavato arhato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arhato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arhato samma sambuddhasa. Buddhang dhammang sanggang namasami. As kind of introduced, uh, this morning we will be touching on caring for the family. And of course, together with that, having a peaceful livelihood. As mentioned, uh, this is uh, uh, an extract from a senza from the Mangala Sutta found in the Kudaka Nikaya. It's called some blessings. And these are blessings number 11, 12, and 13, which we will cover today. Giving support to parents, cherishing wife and children, and also business pursuits, peaceful and free from conflicts. These are often classified as basic responsibility for the householder. Again, we revisit those things which we all desire. In the special sutta, the Buddha has mentioned that these five things are desirable, beloved, and agreeable but difficult to obtain in the world. What are the five? We all want long life, beauty or handsomeness, happiness, fame, and rebirth in heaven. Now of these five things, house lord, I do not teach that they are to be obtained through prayer nor through wishing. If one could obtain them through prayer or wishing, who would not obtain them. And, the, and from this particular sutta, we can conclude that in Buddhism, there are no prayers. There are expressions of homage, of uh, gratitude, and so on. But no prayers. That means asking uh, what they call a higher deity for uh, to fulfill your wishes. There is no such wishing involved in Buddhism. Now, for a noble disciple, house lord, who wishes to have long life, beauty, happiness, fame, and rebirth in heaven, it is not proper that he should pray for all these. He should rather follow a way of life that is conducive to long life, beauty, happiness, fame, and rebirth in heaven. So the key aspect here is follow a way of life. So, and the Buddha says, by following such a path, he would obtain long life, beauty, happiness, fame, and rebirth in heaven. And very often, many Buddhists wonder, why did the Buddha teach the Dhamma Vinaya? Or some people will say, what is Buddhism about? And for some of us, we can actually uh, say plainly that the Buddha addressed this question in this particular sutta from the Sangyutta Nikaya, chapter 4, sutta number 5. The Buddha one day, in, together with the first 60 arahats or enlightened disciples of the Buddha uh, near Varanasi at the Deer Park at Isi Patana, the Buddha said, Monks, I am freed from all snares, snares being defilements, both human and divine. You are also free from all snares, both human and divine. Wander forth, monks, for the welfare and the happiness of the people, out of compassion for the world, for the benefit, welfare, happiness of gods and humans. Here, clearly, the Buddha says that the teachings that he has discovered and shared with these first 60 arahats, and in which, in this case, he's asking them to go out and share for the benefit of the people, uh, for the welfare and happiness of gods and humans. Why do they want to share? 
out of compassion for the world. So the Buddha's mission together with the, the Sangha, the enlightened Sangha, to share the Dhamma or what the Buddha calls Dhamma Vinaya is out of compassion for the world. Teach the Dhamma that is good in the beginning, good in the middle, good in the end, meaningful and well phrased, and reveal the spiritual practice that's entirely full and pure. There are beings with little dust in their eyes. They are in decline because they haven't heard the teaching. There will be those who understand the teaching. Now, the import of these last uh, few lines is very important. Not all beings are able to understand what the Buddha has taught. And those who, who have little dust in their eyes have an opportunity to hear. And so it is our duty to share whatever little bit we know with them and introduce them to the Dhamma Vinaya as taught by the Buddha. Now, this particular aspect, although found in the Sutta mentioned from the Sanyota Nikaya, this has also been repeated in the Vinaya Pitaka, in the Mahavaga. Now, back to the giving support to parents. Now, we need to be caring, uh, what they call children, in support of our parents. Our parents grow old. We ourselves may have children and we ourselves will be growing old. Uh, this is the nature of life. And hopefully, we too show an example to our children how we take care of them. But for new parents, there is such a thing called parent support groups or parents supporting parents. Especially for new parents, Okay, so far we have assumed that giving support to parents means the child has grown up as an adult. But very often, uh, parents are new. New parents may have just obtained a newborn and therefore there is a need for support either through the, the states or the government's uh, medical system and social system or sometimes through volunteer organizations. Hence, the, the aspect of parent support groups. So we can provide support, teach young, new parents how to take care of the newborns and so on. As the children grow older, you have aspect of education. And not everyone is able to, uh, uh, what they call, afford uh, additional educational opportunities. And therefore, the concept of free school also comes in. So giving support to parents, not just children supporting the parents, but also parents supporting parents. In the free school, the top, top right picture, you show, you can see a volunteer teacher uh, encouraging and uh, giving inspiration to students uh, in certain subjects taught in this free school. Free schools normally teach uh, the school curriculum, provide a kind of additional tuition. And the bottom right picture also shows a classroom full of students uh, together with their uh, volunteer teachers teaching various school subjects like mathematics and so on. So giving support to parents, uh, usually, typically in the Mangala Sutta, talks about the, the children giving support to the parents. But in the wider sphere, uh, socially, uh, parents can also help to support other parents by sharing their experience and provide services. This is very, very wholesome. And of course, we come to the Sigalo Vada Sutta, often called the Lay Person's Code of Discipline from the Diga Nikaya Sutta number 31. And there are these six directions. And the, right, the red color arrow on the top right-hand corner indicates the eastern direction, the in where the Buddha addresses the interaction of parents and children. That means what are the children's responsibility towards the parents as they age and what are the parents' responsibility towards younger children as they are growing up or when they are brought into the world. Now, without going through the whole of the Sigalovada Sutta, which is a long sutta, we concentrate on parents as the East. Now, the Buddha says, a child should serve their parents as the Eastern Quarter in five ways, thinking, I will support those who supported me. I will do my duty for them. I will maintain the family traditions. I'll take care of the inheritance. When they have passed away, I will make an offering on their behalf. So there are a few areas. Notice uh, the advice given by the Buddha to the children taking care of their parents. Of course, here we assume that uh, typically these are older children, maybe te teenagers, youth, and adults. 
okay, they support those who have supported me. So sometimes when the children, the parents have retired and are in their what they call twilight years, uh, there is a need for the children to provide support, to feed them, to clothe them, to house them, and so on. Do my duty for them. So there are certain duties that may be required and maintain the family traditions. Each one of us come from different cultures. Even within a certain particular race, there are sub-variations of family traditions. So we should try to maintain them if they are reasonable. I'll take care of the inheritance. Of course, we do not want to squander inheritance from our parents and so on. And not just when they are alive, uh, when they are still with us, but also when they have passed away. I'll make an offering on their behalf. And so this morning, we will touch on the aspect of after they have passed away, how do we make an offering on their behalf? Now, parents served by their children. Now, here we are touching on the parents' duties towards the children. Parents served by their children in these five ways show compassion to them in these five ways. And that's how the Eastern Quarter is covered, kept safe and free of peril. Uh, we'll come back to this in greater detail in the later slides. Now, uh, we have come across situations when, when parents get older, very often they are not able to take care of themselves and therefore, uh, what I call additional physical help, even not just mental help, but physical help is needed. We might need to feed, bathe and clothe our parents. So these are some of the uh, duties which children have towards their parents. Now, here, in this particular sutta, uh, we talk about the Brahma at home, uh, the gods at home. Here, the Buddha says, mother and father, compassionate to their family, are called Brahma. First teachers, those worthy of gifts from their children. So the wise should pay them homage, honor with food and drink, clothing and bathing, anointing and bathing and washing their feet. Performing these services, to their parents, the wise are praised right here. And after that, rejoice in heaven. So these are this is yet another location within the Tibitaka where the Buddha talks about uh, how we should uh, pay respect or serve our parents. And this is recorded in the Sutta, record in the Iti Futaka, also found in the Kudaka Nikaya. Now continuing. I tell you, monks, there are two people who are not easy to repay. Which two? Your mother and father. If, even if you were to carry your mother on one shoulder and your father on the other shoulder for 100 years and were to look after them by anointing, massaging, bathing and rubbing their limbs and they were to defecate and urinate right there on your shoulders, you would not in that way pay, uh, repay, your parents. If you were to establish your mother and father in absolute sovereignty over this great earth, abounding in the seven treasures, you would not in that way pay or repay your parents. And why is that? Mother and father do much for their children. They care for them. They nourish them. They introduce them to the world. But anyone who rouses his unbelieving mother and father settles and establishes them in conviction or confidence or faith, okay? The key word, Pali word is called Sadda, which is trans typically translated as conviction or confidence. Rouses his unvirtuous mother and father, settles and establishes them in sila, in virtue or moral training. Rouses his stingy uh, mother and father, settles and establishes them in generosity. Here, the Pali word is chaga. Chaga is not uh, giving, it is generosity. We are often confusing the word chaga with dana. Dana means giving, which is a subset of chaga. Giving is an aspect of generosity. So chaga is a, uh, what they call, a bigger umbrella covering this aspect of generosity. Rouses his foolish mother and father settles and establishes them in discernment or wisdom, panya, sampada. So to this extent, one pays and repays one's mother and father. 
Now, this uh, previous page and this is from the Kata New Sutta from the Anguttara Nikaya, uh, Book of Two. Furthermore, the Blessed One said, Now, what is the level of a person of no integrity? A person of no integrity is ungrateful and unthankful. This ingratitude, this lack of thankfulness is advocated by rude people. It is entirely on the level of people of no integrity. A person of integrity is grateful and thankful. This gratitude, this thankfulness is advocated uh, by civil people. is entirely in the level of people of integrity. This also is from the same sutta, the Katanyu Sutta. Katanyu meaning gratefulness. Now, from the Karaniya Metta Sutta, which we just recited just now in the Puja, here, of course, the sutta covers a, casts a bigger net, a wider net. So, an extract from the sutta, wishing in gladness and in safety, May all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child, so with the boundless heart, should one cherish all living beings, raiding loving kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, free from hatred and ill will, whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding. And back to the top, portion of the of the Karinia Metta Sutta, which is underlined here, even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child. So here, the Buddha is encouraging that we should show loving kindness towards uh, our children. Okay? Of course, vice versa. Because with a boundless heart, should one cherish all living beings. So it's not this loving kindness is not confined to our parents or to our children, but to all living beings, reading kindness all over the entire world. But here, of course, we are looking at parents. May our parents be at ease. So we should pay special attention in this direction too. Now, when the parents, as they grow old and later in, in years and later pass away, we have this aspect in the Buddhist tradition. And we need to understand what is this tradition about? Frequently called Patidana, which is dedication of merits. Now, why are why is there dedication of merits? Because there is gratitude towards departed relatives, especially our parents. Now, in this practice, one should perform meritorious deeds with pure and undefiled thoughts so that merits could be dedicated to ancestors and departed relatives who may have been reborn as hungry ghosts, pet, often called peta. In the Anguttara Nikaya, it is mentioned that parents wish for sharing of merits from the children once they are gone. So this is extracted from the TBCM uh, 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 Facebook. Now here, the bottom side, we have a picture that shows the pouring of water uh, into from a small container into a larger bowl. Uh, we'll describe this aspect. Uh, why is this, uh, what they call, indicative of dedication of merits or patidana? Now, when we talk about, very often we have Buddhist centers uh, chanting books and uh, the commentaries, commentators by various uh, quarters. They mention that uh, as far as patidana, let us transfer our merits. The word transfer is often mentioned. And transferring what? your merits to the departed and so here you have an article uh, an extract from that and which i encourage you to actually go through and read so here venerable agatita has uh, commented on this aspect in the tirokuda sutta uh, behind the wall discourse from the fifth nikaya meaning the kudaka nikaya 
In the first verse of this sutta, the word peta is mentioned. Most Buddhists equate this word to hungry ghost. That is a ghost in a miserable state of existence. In this sutta, however, peta refers to the departed one, not necessarily a hungry ghost only. So it's not confined to those who are reborn as hungry ghosts, which is the third level of existence from the bottom in the scheme of 31 planes of existence. Humans are born at the fifth level from the bottom. So hungry ghosts are below the human realm at number three. So peta does not necessarily refer to hungry ghosts only, but to also the departed one, according to Venerable Agatita. The earlier Nikayas and Vinaya Pitika define peta in this same way. The first verse starts off by saying that the living, having uh, prepared a sumptuous meal, do not invite the departed to enter the dwelling, to partake of the food. This is due to the departed one's past unskillful karma or unwholesome karma, and therefore they have to gather outside at the road corners, compounds, doors, windows, etc. The second verse mentions that people who have compassion for the deceased should actually prepare suitable food and dedicate them to their departed souls. What is given to them reaches the departed as sure as rainwater flows from the hills down to the sea. Now, this statement, as sure as rainwater flows from the hills down to the sea, this is the symbolism in which uh, in the Buddhist Patidana, we pour water into a larger container, try to simulate or provide a visual representation of rainwater surely will flow down the hill to down to the sea. Now, after dana, we frequently chant these lines from this verse. Idang vo nyati nang ho tu sukita hon tu yo. We are actually saying, may this be for you all, departed relatives. May you relatives be well and happy. Uh, I'd like to add an additional comment about this uh, Pali verse. Now, notice, Idang vo nyati nang ho tu sukita hon tu yo. There is no mention of punya, which is called merits. After all, we are talking about transference of merits, as there is no Pali word called transference in this verse either. So merits are not mentioned specifically. Transference is not mentioned even in the Pali. Therefore, the English structure is such. May this be for you all, the relatives. May you, relatives, be well and happy. The key word here is the Pali word, may idang, the first Pali word. Translated as may this. What is this? This we are are we talking about? So we are referring to uh, some meritorious deed, typically offering of dana in terms of food, uh, breakfast or lunch dana to the monastics. So may this recently conducted dana or offering or wholesome uh, what they call act, which we offer to the maha sangha. Okay, idang. So may this. Vo means you all. Okay. Nyati nang means departed relatives. So may this. So to, to recite this, you need to have performed a wholesome meritorious deed uh, immediately before chanting this particular verse, which is the custom. Now, moving to the center portion of this page, the notes. Sometimes different words are used. Instead of idang vo nyati nang, you have Idang no nyatinang or idang me nyatinang are chanted. They are all they can all be used, but they have slightly different meanings. Idang vo, the vo means you all, idang no means our, and very commonly chanted is idang me means my, may my, huh? may my relatives, my departments benefit from these merits. This is what is intended by the chant. Now this is the controversy regarding transference of merits. According to the Theravada understanding of the law of karma, we are the makers and heirs of our own karma. Okay, this is very important. Therefore, there is no question of sharing or transferring. So even if you don't like the word transferring, the word sharing is also objectionable. There's no question of sharing or transferring meritorious karma to another. 
So the concept of transfer of merits contradicts this understanding. To put it another way, uh, the word transferring or sharing denotes minusing a wholesome coming energies from our coming account to the departed person's coming account. There is no such concept in the law of karma as taught by the Buddha. So the word sharing and transferring has no place in the Dhamma Vinaya in the first place. Now, a dismembered spirit might be restricted in their movements by certain laws that we do not yet understand. So when we invite them to partake of the food offered, perhaps they rejoice in the good that we do. And in this way, they create merits for themselves. As mentioned, the law of karma means we create our own merits and we, uh, what do you call it, experience or inherit uh, the merits that we have generated earlier. Okay. Now, the key word here is perhaps they rejoice in the good. This sounds very much like the Buddhist concept of mudita, uh, rejoicing, appreciative joy. So we have to invite the departed relatives uh, if they are able to witness our performing of the wholesome action, witness that, and we invite them to rejoice over this uh, good action. And with this, if they are able to witness our performance of this wholesome action, in this case, maybe uh, offering food to the Sangha, uh, dana to the Sangha, uh, they may rejoice. And if they are able to rejoice, then they create merits for themselves. So on, in this process, there has been no transferring of minus karma from your account to send to your departed relatives. Now, this poses an issue. If they are not able to witness the event, perhaps they were born as already reborn as another human being, maybe in another living being's womb, uh, or born in the hell worlds where they are not able to come and join in the and witness the wholesome act, then they will not be able to rejoice, and therefore they cannot create merits for themselves. So there are limitations to this rejoicing in the good. But the, the fact is that we do not know where our departed relatives have been reborn. So all this party dana is just in case they are uh, in, the, in the realms whereby they are able to come and witness our wholesome act. Of course, we invite them to join in and hopefully they are able to rejoice in these good actions and thereby they create merits for themselves. So as I said in the last part of my book, this is Venerable Agatita's book, Honoring the Departed, giving dana is a low-end type of merit-making. Uh, this is important. There are many ways in which to do, do, do uh, merit-making. Dana is only one of them. And an important aspect here, as mentioned by Venerable Agatita, apparently the beneficiary of our dana must be aware that they, we are offering the dana and they must rejoice in order to be able to benefit from it. This is the late, uh, limitation of pati dana for uh, our loved ones or our friends who have passed away. Now, the, for the high-end type of merit making, such as chanting, metta, uh, vipassana, meditation, this awareness may not be required. Now, other than the link, the source given uh, to sasanaraka.org, the last line at the bottom of this page is very important. Uh, the previous page mentioned the different kinds of, uh, of merit making, some low end and some high end. So more on low or high end type of merit making, check out the Velama Sutta from the Angotura Nikaya, Book of Nine, Sutta number 20 where the Buddha grades the different kinds of merit-making. And dana is often regarded as the low-end type of merit-making. Even if you perform dana uh, as to the Buddha and the Mahasangha, that means the Sangika dana, is compared to other kinds of merit that, are, that you may perform, even the Sangika dana is considered a low-end type of merit-making. So for more details, check out the Velama Sutta. Now, more recently, 
uh, there was a uh, Dhamma sharing by Venerable Dr. S. Pemaratana Thera, uh, who came over to uh, Malaysia. And in the uh, YouTube sharing on, on the YouTube channel called BMV, Buddhist Mahavihara, Dhamma Dana series, and this was done in the year 2024. Title of this uh, Dhamma sharing is called Merit Bank. How does one transfer merit to another? So do check out uh, the YouTube channel called BMV Dhamma Dana series or follow the YouTube link given on this page. So here is a typical end of a wholesome uh, merit session. We have Pati Dana, dedication of merits. Idang vo nyati nang ho tu sukita hontu nyatanyu. Which means, may this be for you all departed relatives. May you relatives be well and happy. And this is recorded. This is extracted from the Thiro Kuda Sutta. Okay, from the Kudaka Nikaya. Now, moving on regarding uh, the Mangala Sutta blessing, we have cherishing wife and children. Now, back to the Sikalobada Sutta. On the West, we, the Buddha advises that, uh, advise the relationship between a husband and a wife, duties of a husband and wife. Now, the children aspect has already been dealt with on the Eastern side with regarding parents and children. And now we're talking about relationship between husband and wife in the Sikalovada Sutta. Now, here we continue from the aspect of children, which was extracted from the earlier, earlier section, parents as the East. Parents served by the children in these five ways show compassion to them in five ways. They keep them from doing bad. They support them in doing good. They train them in the profession. They connect them with a suitable partner. They transfer the inheritance in due time. Now, they keep them from doing bad. Of course, parents uh, have a duty to teach the young children as they grow up uh, from doing uh, what they call evil things, bad things that hurt other living beings and themselves. They support them in doing good. Support means to teach them to do. They explain why it is good to do encourage them to do. So support covers a wide range of activities for the parent in educating the young child and even teenagers and, and sometimes uh, as needed, even the youth in encouraging them to do good and wholesome actions. Train them in the profession. Well, in those days, 2,500, 2,600 years ago, very often families uh, pass on their, their skills, their know-how to their children. So hence, the profession is passed down within the family. So if they are farmers planting certain kinds of crops, they have certain, uh, what I call, uh, professional skills in that direction. So they will teach their children and the children continue in the same profession. Of course, today, uh, the situation has changed a lot. Uh, the, the parents may be farmers, but the children may have uh, other opportunities open to them to further study. They may become professional accountants, engineers, doctors, and so on. So they did not necessarily uh, get trained in their profession. But as they grow up, it is inevitable that they will be helping their parents, uh, tending, say, maybe the farm or the orchard or something like that. And very often, these children have additional skills up their sleeve, so, sort of. They connect them with a suitable partner. Now, the key issue here is not to arrange marriage, uh, but most people assume that it is arrangement, but connect them. That means introduce them to a suitable partner. So the parents uh, uh, has a, a, a responsibility to check out whether a, a potential partner is suitable or not. Now, suitability covers a wide range from uh, from uh, what they call having chats with them or so sitting with them. Of course, in ancient days, we have things like uh, what they call checking your horoscope and so other things. Uh. So whatever means the parents use. Connecting them, not forcing them, but connecting them, but introducing them. Of course, the children have a responsibility also to look for a suitable partner and consider the recommendations from their parents and transfer the inheritance in due time. Uh, with some of the horror stories today, we have uh, incidents where uh, the children uh, more recently, uh, just a few days in the recent festivities, uh, children have been known to just 
uh, leave the parents at the roadside, you know, old parents. So we have that uh, problem. And hopefully the parents, if they have certain means, they have not uh, transferred the inheritance. Otherwise, the children, the what they call the bad children or the unwholesome children might just uh, run off with their uh, transferred inheritance and leave the parents, the old age parents, to fend for themselves. So even as parents, we have to be wise to know the character of our children and there's a need for just in case these situations also. Now moving on to the uh, the the relationship between uh, the husband and the wife. So husband should serve uh, his wife as a Western quarter in five ways: by treating her with honor, by not looking down on her, by not being unfaithful, by relinquishing authority to her, and by presenting her with adornments. So this is in keeping to uh, the character and so on. Now. The third aspect here, by not being unfaithful, that aspect is very important. And sometimes uh, it, some people who have broken this, uh, who have been unfaithful, they of, often break the third precept. So this is an aspect of the precepts also. And a wife served by her husband in these five ways shows compassion to him in five ways. She is well organized in her work. She manages the domestic help. She is not unfaithful. She preserves his earnings. She is deaf and tireless in all her duties. Now, this list is reflective of uh, what you call uh, the culture 2,500 years ago in India, okay, where typically the, the women folk are in the household and sometimes even in the, the fields and so on. But of course, today, things have changed. There has been a need of dual income uh, women have become professionals in their own right. So this is reflective of culture also. Okay. So a wife served by her husband in these five ways, show compassion to him in these five ways. And that's how the Western Quarter is covered, kept safe and free of peril. The bottom right picture uh, is more reflective of the, uh, the modern culture these days. Uh, previously, the wife was expected to take care of the home. She was not working. But now the wife may be a professional. The husband may be also a professional. And both need to share duties at home, to take care of the home, to clean the home, maybe even to cook and take care of the children. So these are the changes in culture over time. Business pursuits, peaceful and free from conflicts. So business pursuits or occupation, there are many kinds from the top left picture here, from the farming area, uh, bot bottom left, you have the factory type operations. Center top, we have the business type uh, negotiations and so on. And bottom, some may be very skilled culinary, to have uh, culinary skills. And the top right here, we have uh, industrial type applications. And the bottom, uh, what they call uh, the cyber world. So many kinds of occupations. But of whatever kinds of occupations the Buddha warns in this Vanija Sutta from the Anguttara Nikaya Book of Five, Sutta number 177, the Buddha said, Monks, a lay follower, should not engage in these five trades. What five? Trade in weapons, living creatures, meat, intoxicants, and poisons. A lay follower should not engage in these trades. And why is that? Typically, weapons hurt another living being. And the whole purpose of, uh, of Dhamma Vina, as taught by the Buddha, is to show compassion, to show loving kindness to all living beings. So do, we do not want to use weapons. We do not want to, uh, what they call, trade in weapons and provide means to other people to hurt yet other pe living people. Living creatures, that means to keep livestock and so on. To trade in meat, being butchers and fishermen and so on. Uh, the trade in intoxicants, may, encouraging people to consume intoxicants. Intoxicants is very wide. Intoxicants can cover drugs, drugs as in the uh, heroin, uh, those who are which are very, very, uh, what they call addictive. Okay. And of course, poisons. So this is the, the, the important thing which the Buddha advised that we should not be engaged in as far as uh, earning our livelihood. And back to the Sigalovada Sutta, and towards the bottom, Nadir, 
the Buddha comments about the relationship between an employer and employees. Now, born servants and workers as beneath. A master should serve their born servants and workers as the lower quarters in five ways. By organizing work according to ability, by paying food and wages, by nursing them when sick, when sharing special treats, and by giving time off work. So this is an employer's duty towards the workers. Now, organizing work according to ability, that's where the interview and training comes in. Okay, if you are up, want to upgrade a person's uh, ability or skills, you need to train them and so on. Paying for food and wages. Today, of course, uh, uh, what they call mostly wages and we buy our own food. But in some countries, the company also pays for lunch and so on and provides this uh, lunch literally within the company and so on. By nursing them when sick, uh, there was back in 2500, today we call uh, medical leave. We can take leave to see a, a doctor, maybe uh, under the company panel and so on. Uh, so to take care of our sickness, to share special treats, uh, that's when uh, the, the employer goes off to some foreign land and brings in some chocolates or something like that for the employees to, to, to uh, ravish over. Giving time off work, well, sounds very much like annual leave and such leave that we have today. So this was advised by the Buddha. So bond servants and workers served by a master in these five ways, show compassion to him in five ways. So literally the workers who have been served by their employer, okay, need to respect the employer. They get up first and go to bed last. They don't steal. They do their work well and they promote a good reputation. So workers get up first and go to bed last. This is typical of the work situation 2,500 years ago. Uh, as far as we are concerned, modern day, we have to be at work on time. Uh, there are some occupations where it is okay to, uh, to have what they call flexi hours that is arranged by the employer. But some work, especially in factory type occupations, everybody has to show up on time because you depend on the other worker to pass you items to you to work on and then you finish your portion of the work to pass on the other. So there's no flexi time in some factory work type situations, conveyor belt time. So it depends on the situation. They don't steal. That goes without staying. Uh, they do their work well. Well, you try your best. We are professionals after all. And you must promote, promote a good reputation, the employer's good reputation, so that uh, your work uh, your work is of good quality and of course the product can sell and so on. This is the nature of business and uh, production situations today. So all the uh, earlier advices take time to develop and it's gradual. We may not be there, we may not be proficient in, in, in observing and practicing what the Buddha taught. And here the Buddha in the Uposatta Sutta mentioned, just as the ocean has a gradual shell, a gradual slope, a gradual inclination with a sudden drop off only after a long stretch. In the same way, this doctrine and discipline or Dhamma Vinaya has uh, a gradual training, a gradual performance, a gradual progression with a penetration to the Noxis or Nibbana only after a long stretch. And this Sutta is found in the Udana, also from the Udaka Nikaya. So everything is step by step. You have to practice to, to practice makes perfect, as they say. So that was this morning's coverage of blessing number 11, 12, and 13, as recorded in the Mangala Sutta, the Sutta on blessing or on good fortune within our lives. In the end, whatever the Buddha taught, this the Mapanda verse 183 comes to mind. Sabba pa pusa akarana, pusala sa upasampada, sa citta paridapanang, etang uddana sasana. That we should avoid all evil, do good, and purify our minds. This is the teaching of the Buddhas. Saddamu chirang titattu. May the good doctrine long endure. Sabbe sata suki hontu. May all be happy. Sadu, sadu, sadu. That's the end of uh, this morning sharing from me. 
Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you, Brother Ananda Fong, for that very uh, meaningful and very useful sharing, uh, which is actually very practical for our daily living. Uh, sometimes we forget what are our duties and what are the duties of the other members. So this is a very good reminder. So thank you, Brother Ananda Fong. And uh, we shall end this tonight today sunday puja by dedicating merits to all beings akasatta ca bhumatta devanaga mahitika punyantang anumodetwa chirang rakhantu loka sasanam ettavata ca amhehi Sambatang punya sampadang Sabbe deva, sabbe buta Sabbe satta anumodantu Sabbe sampati siddhya Idang menyati nang hotu Sukita hontu nyatayo Idang me nyati nang hotu sukita hontu nyatayo Idang me nyati nang hotu sukita hontu nyatayo Our aspirations Nimina punya kamena Mame bala samagamo satang samagamo hotu yavani bana patiya sadu sadu sad